Last week we explored the world of magnetic recording. Our job this week is to take a look at two different concepts and less of a technology. First, we'll be talking about High fidelity. High fidelity. You've heard a lot about it, but what is it? I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. So what is sound? Well, we already explored that a little bit in the first episode, but let's recap. Sound is simply moving air. When something vibrates, it causes the air around it to vibrate back and forth very rapidly. This air then travels to your ears and then causes your eardrums to move back and forth very rapidly as well. Our brains are able to interpret the stimulation coming from our ears as sound. But until the advent of high fidelity, any sound being created by an artificial source sounded radically different than actual sound. The problem was that these artificial sources could not accurately reproduce the sound, and that's what high fidelity is. High fidelity is the technology that allows us to accurately reproduce the sounds we need. So for starters, let's talk about sounds that we can and can't hear. Human hearing has a range between 20 and 20,000 hertz, or 20 kilohertz. If we want to be able to hear all the sounds from the recording, then that recording has to be able to reproduce sounds within the range and produce all of them. That's what's called, in high fidelity lingo, complete frequency range. Early sound recording technologies could not capture all these sounds, and that's why they sounded like they did. In the case of acoustic phonographs, only some of the noise being picked up by the recording mechanism could actually be recorded on the disc. Any sounds outside that range simply didn't get recorded, and that meant the recording had a very limited frequency range. The electronic microphone really helped things here because it was much more sensitive and could pick up a larger portion of our frequency range. You hear the low tones and the high tones. And once we got to the technology of the tape recorder, the entire frequency range could be picked up by these newly sensitive microphones and could be recorded onto a medium. But recording is only half the battle. The other thing we need to do is reproduce the sound that we recorded. Here, high fidelity also takes a new approach. We talked about the loudspeaker in our episode on radio, but those loudspeakers were very simple compared to loudspeakers of today. Again, to recap, the loudspeaker takes an electronic signal and transfers that into motion of a diaphragm. By rapidly moving the diaphragm in and out, we can create a sound wave. But here we run into another problem. The loudspeaker is only suited for reproducing certain sounds. It can't reproduce the whole spectrum. And the reason for that is pretty simple. It all boils down to size. This big loudspeaker can make low sounds really easily, and it makes them well. In order to make a very low sound effectively, there has to be a lot of movement, because the sound wave itself is very large. But the movement of the diaphragm doesn't have to be very fast, because we're dealing with low frequencies. The problem is when we get to the high frequencies. In this case, the movement has to be very, very fast, but it doesn't have to be too big. Here, the big speaker's size works against it. In this case, the speaker is simply too big to make those very high frequency sounds. It has too much mass, and therefore it can't move fast enough. So to make a very high frequency sound, we need a different solution. If we were to shrink the diaphragm down to a very small size, now the diaphragm could move extremely quickly because there isn't a lot of mass to push around. This would mean that it could make high frequency sounds excellently. But now we have the opposite problem of the large loudspeaker. This loudspeaker can't make low sounds at all. It can only make very high frequency noises. Early loudspeakers used a kind of compromise. They used a medium-sized loudspeaker that could make sounds in the middle range just fine, but sounds in the high range couldn't get very high, and sounds in the low range weren't very low. Sometimes you would see very large loudspeakers that were very lightweight. This was a sort of okay way of dealing with it, but the low frequency noises weren't very powerful. The real solution would be to put a large speaker together with a small speaker. If you take a look at any modern hi-fi speaker, you'll find it has multiple speakers inside of it. Now this is where we get to some new naming. Today we would call this whole unit the loudspeaker, and the individual components inside are called drivers. Each driver is tailored to its specific needs, and in general, we need a minimum of two. The larger driver in this speaker is called the woofer, and the smaller driver is called the tweeter. These somewhat goofy names have of course to do with the sounds they can make. The woofer makes deep noises like a dog's bark, and a tweeter makes high noises like the tweet of a bird. To help ensure each driver gets only the noise it's supposed to get, there's an electronic component inside here called a crossover. This splits the signal coming into the loudspeaker between the woofer and the tweeter, so the woofer only gets the low frequency sounds, and the tweeter only gets the high frequency sounds. 
this speaker only has two drivers, and the woofer isn't very large. That means that while it makes high sounds very well, there's a limit to the low sounds that it can make. In general, to have a loud booming bass, you need to have a very large woofer. So here's a different high fidelity speaker. This one actually has four drivers. Two of them are large woofers, and there's a tweeter as well on top. But now there's a third type of driver called a mid-range driver. The reason why we have this is because the woofers are too large to make the mid-range noises, and the tweeter is too small to make those noises as well. So now we have a gap. Let me explain that a little better. Each driver has a range of frequencies that it can produce. The woofer here can make frequencies between 80 and 6000 Hz. The tweeter can make frequencies between 5 and 20,000 Hz. So we have a healthy overlap of 1000 Hz and we only need two drivers. The only compromise is that the woofer cannot make very low sounds. But if we want to have those very low sounds, then we need to have bigger woofers. These woofers here work as a pair, and they can make sounds down to about 35 Hz. But they can only go up to about 1000 Hz. Then their sound drops off. So if we use the same tweeter as before, we would have a pair of drivers that can make between 35 and 1000 Hz noises, and a tweeter that makes 6000 to 20000 Hz noises. Except no noises between 1000 and 5000 Hz are accounted for. There's a gap. And that's what the mid-range driver is for. This driver is able to make sounds between about 500 and 8000 Hz. Now we have a healthy overlap between both the woofer and tweeter, and the complete frequency range is able to be reproduced. If you're wondering why there's a hole at the bottom of the speaker, well, this is what's called ported bass. Since the diaphragms and loudspeakers do move in and out, they're not just pushing the air in front of them. They're also pushing the air behind them. In a typical speaker cabinet, this air is simply trapped in the box. But with ported bass, a hole is placed in the cabinet so that this air can resonate inside the cabinet and make its way outside. This helps to boost the bass being created, but it does have a few side effects which we won't go into right now. But frequency response is just one part of high fidelity. We also have to deal with volume. Music is not all at one volume. In fact, music usually has quiet parts and loud parts. So to have a truly high fidelity sound, we need a way to make super quiet noise quiet and loud noise loud. That's the high fidelity characteristic called wide dynamic range. Do you remember the real scratching noise that came from the Victrola? The noise was always there, so it meant that real quiet sounds can't really be heard. Also, you couldn't get it to be too loud either. The record couldn't take all that volume. This is what's called the signal-to-noise ratio. In order to have a high dynamic range, you want to have a very big signal-to-noise ratio. In the past, the noise was very loud, so that meant that even with a strong signal, the ratio between the signal and the noise was small. This limited dynamic range. Ideally, there would be no noise at all, however, this is pretty hard to accomplish. To get recordings with a high signal-to-noise ratio, we need a recording material that could both hold a lot of volume and also didn't have a lot of noise. One of the biggest improvements for the record was the vinyl record. By using vinyl instead of shellac, as was used in old 78 RPM records, the surface of the record was much smoother, and therefore you had much less noise coming from the record itself. Also, vinyl was softer and could have more detailed grooves made in it. This meant that not only was there more detail in the grooves, but the grooves were also louder. Tape recorders already had a pretty good signal-to-noise ratio, but that would be improved upon later with noise reduction. We'll explore that in a separate Tech Explorations episode. The last piece of high fidelity has to do with the detail in the sound. This is called definition. Having a recording with high dynamic range and excellent frequency response is not the only goal. We also need the recording to be very detailed. See, the frequency of the sound is not the only thing. The shape of the sound is also important. Take a clarinet and a violin. They can both make the same note, yet they sound very different. Even though the sound they are making is at the same frequency, they are different pieces to that frequency that give them a unique sound. In good high fidelity recordings, the instruments sound true to themselves. The violin sounds like a violin, the clarinet like a clarinet. You can tell them apart when they play together. That has to do with the shape of the sound wave. Just as a quick example, this is what a sine wave sounds like, and now a square wave, and now a sawtooth wave. The frequencies of each of these waves were each 440 hertz, however they sounded very different. The only thing that changed was their shape. So in order to be able to tell different instruments apart, the shape of the sound wave also has to be made accurately in the recording. So now we've got high fidelity down pat. A good high fidelity recording has three things. A wide dynamic range, a complete frequency response, and a highly detailed recording. But there's still something missing from the basic high fidelity recordings that we all enjoy today. You may have noticed that you have two ears. At least I hope you do. So to have the most natural sounding sound, you should have two sound sources, one for each ear. This is what's called a stereo sound. You'll notice that you have two speakers in virtually every setup. 
Your headphones have two drivers, one for each ear. Your TV probably has two speakers. Boom boxes have two speakers. And practically any hi-fi setup today will have at least two speakers, if not more. Stereo gave recordings dimension. Think about a concert hall with a complete orchestra. Depending on where you're sitting, you'll be able to hear different instruments at different volumes, and you'll be able to pick out where they are. You can do this because of the fact that you have two ears. Your two ears allow you to locate the source of a sound. So if we recorded an orchestra with only one microphone, then we would run into the problem of having a very flat sounding recording. It would be like if you covered one ear and placed your open ear towards the orchestra. Sure, you could be able to hear all the detail of the sound, but it wouldn't sound quite right. Try it yourself. Listen to some music with one ear covered. It won't sound nearly as good. But if we recorded the orchestra twice, with one microphone facing to the right and the other to the left, then we could have two separate sound sources. If we played them back together with the right microphone's output going to a speaker on your right and vice versa, then you would be able to relive the experience of the concert. That was the original idea behind stereo recording. The sorts of goofy effects that you find in recordings today, well they didn't come around till later. So as you can imagine, recording in stereo complicated things a bit. The biggest challenge was in recording. How can you take two separate sources and record them together at the same time? Well, the tape recorder solved that one pretty easily. Looking back at our Sony tape recorder from last week's episode, you'll see that it actually has two heads. One of these records the left channel and the other records the right channel. Because they are physically next to each other on the tape, they would record the sound at the exact same time and in the exact same place. You simply use one half of the tape for one channel and the other half for the other channel. But tape recorders like this never really made it into the home. The dominant form of music was always the disc and you're probably not surprised to learn that a disc was turned into a stereo format. Since the early 1960s and indeed the late 1950s, vinyl records were in stereo. How could we achieve stereo on a groove? If you're thinking that there are actually two grooves next to each other and there are two styly reading the double groove, well that's not it. The way it works is actually much cooler. Going way back to some of our first episodes, you might remember that Thomas Edison and Emil Berliner recorded sound on their respective photographs in a different way. Thomas Edison used an up and down motion of a stylus, and Berliner used the side to side motion. Stereo records used both. Inside this phonograph cartridge are actually two electromagnetic pickups. They are arranged on right angles to each other, so that as the stylus moves up and down, it moves one pickup, and when it moves side to side, it moves the other. Each one of these pickups corresponds to the left and right channel of a stereo recording. In the groove of the record itself, the height of the groove varied along with the left channel and the walls of the groove vibrated left and right with the right channel. So the depth of the groove constantly varied and this is what contained the left channel signal. This was just like in Edison's original phonograph. And the walls of the groove wobbled left and right and this is what made the right channel. In an almost poetic way, the different technologies for Edison and Berliner would come together in the stereo record. So now, thanks to the technology of high-fidelity speakers, records, and tape recording, we have stereo high-fidelity sound. We've now laid the groundwork for all future recording methods. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Technology Connections. In next week's episode, we'll be looking at the next big thing, and it's actually small. We'll be taking a look at solid-state amplification and miniaturization. And so, as they say, hearing is believing. You can hear the difference on any phonograph. But to hear it best, listen to this record on a new orthophonic high-fidelity Victrola. Now turn the record over and listen to new orthophonic high-fidelity sound. Enjoy yourself.